how to talk about race and equity um, in the classroom. So Delson gave us a, a little preview um, of what I want to talk about. He gave the student perspective. I'm going to talk a little from the teacher perspective now. Um, and then first, I want to just uh, reiterate some of the things that have been said in so far in this webinar and also in the chat that um, conversations that focus on race and equity um, in general can, can be really difficult. And you might get pushback from the organizations that you work for, from your students, um, et cetera. And it can also be really emotionally draining <laughs> um, for both students and teachers. So that's just kind of a, like a warning about that. Um, and that it will never feel like enough. Um, like I wanna really echo what Kamala said in the slide earlier about this work being huge, but often feels insufficient. And that all of that is true, but um, that, so that's all the negative stuff out of the way, but um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And so here's some tips I wanna give you for uh, just how I've done it um, to try to make this a little bit easier. Um, so we're, we're gonna start actually, speaking of Kamala, we're gonna start with um, uh, one more quote from her, which is, um, I'm not a teacher expert, I'm a teacher guide. I'm a person who likes to learn and so I can impart that excitement. My approach is we're going to learn this together. Um, and I think that that is, um, is just a, an important place to start as you're having hard conversations, especially if you're talking about, um, especially or in addition to if you're talking about experiences that might be um, different from your own experiences, but that we're all kind of learning this um, together. And that if you're not excited or interested in what you're teaching, um, and you're not excited or interested in learning about what you're teaching, then it's going to reflect, um, your students will know, <laughs> um, having just done a very boring lesson um, <laughs> for myself, I can tell you, um, it, it didn't go well for any of us, but um, that is also a good learning experience. So first, um, like Cynthia mentioned earlier, hard conversations can help build community in class, but there needs to be a level of trust already established for them to go well. Um, and that's trust between the teacher and the students, but also trust among the students, which I actually think is the most important part. Um, I want to acknowledge also that I've I've just I found this whole process much harder the building community in class much harder now that um, all of my students are on zoom um, and and it's harder for them to respond directly for to each other um, often when we're doing large group um, things especially with technology barriers but that said um, I would say, to build trust in the classroom is key first, to give students a chance to get to know each other outside of the hard conversations, just in general, always kind of bringing in their, their own lives and their own experiences. Um, to have students set their own ground rules for speaking respectively, respectfully <laughs> about um, hard conversations and just in general to invite students to talk about their experiences. And then the most important thing that I have learned is don't respond as the teacher, don't respond to everything. Let the students respond to each other. Um, and I think this is especially true for me anyway, if I disagree with something that a student has said that I wanna immediately give them my opinion. And that um, that's not always the best, uh, the best way to build rapport in your classroom. So to sort of let the students respond to each other and throw questions back at them rather than answering them yourself. Um, for me, when I started thinking about addressing issues of race and equity in my classes, um, it was kind of a mental reframe for um, what it meant for me to teach English. So I just, I started to think about these issues as survival English for my students. 90% um, approximately of my students are black. They're mostly from Haiti. Um, for them, surviving and thriving in the US is not just about going to the grocery store, opening a bank account, doing all of those things, um, but it's also knowing how to respond if pulled over by the police or recognizing discrimination that they might be facing at work and knowing what to do about it. Um, so we heard both of these examples from Delsant in the video. Um, 
in a little while, I'm going to give you access to some of the lesson slideshows that I developed for my classes. And one of those slideshows that you'll have access to is about how to talk to the police if you get pulled over. Um, and we watch videos not only um, about what to say and practice vocabulary about what to say, um, the language part if you get pulled over, but um, also like what to do with your hands, keep your hands on the wheel and narrate what you're doing um, and don't make any sudden movements. And um, these things could be, these things could be a matter of survival for my students to know how to respond in those situations. And, and they come, they're, they're kind of an interesting thing, I think, for me to be teaching as a white person. These are not things that I would necessarily have thought of to teach um, if I had a class of mostly European, Im European immigrants, for example, or white European immigrants. Um, but my students tend to live mostly in immigrant communities, and they don't have a lot of access to, um, to native-born um, Black people in their own communities uh, to, to help them navigate kind of how to do these things. So, um, so now, <laughs> now I do it. Um, so uh, I also just want to say that to remember that this stuff is everyday English. Um, issues of race and equity come up in units about health and transportation and community and employment. Um, this, this slide is just an example of some of the vocabulary that my students um, learned last year when we were talking about um, police brutality, actually, and race and racism. You'll see the articles that this vocabulary comes from in one of the slideshows that I'm going to share with you later. Um, so my job is to guide my students to the English that they need to live their best lives here. Um, and if you look at these words, they're actually very common. Um, if any of our students are listening to the news or reading the newspaper, they're going to come across these words and we'll need them to fully express themselves when they talk about these issues. If, if ICE comes to their door, they're going to need some of these words <laughs> to be able to like uh, respond to that. Um, and they don't just come from explicit lessons on race. In my employment unit, um, we discuss the difference between disrespect and discrimination, for example, as, as important vocabulary. Um, and in a workplace, understanding these differences could really influence how the student responds to what, it, what they are experiencing. Um, and I just want to say that these words, though fairly common, are not words that we find in most textbooks. Um, so it, it takes a little, um, a little addition, a little teacher addition to to get there. Um, and this isn't to say that talking about race has to be its own unit or that you have to do it in every class. Navigating race and racism, equity and, equal and inequity is just part of everyday life, like I've said before. In the health unit, you can talk about access to health care and mental health, how poverty, racism, sexism, et cetera, um, affect our mental health. In the jobs unit, we talk about job safety, workplace discrimination, and which jobs are higher stress and lower pay and who works at them. Um, and this is an especially relevant conversation right now um, that we're having during COVID and who is um, considered an essential worker um, and required to go to work in person. Um, and just one example of a sort of, of a connect to what you already do, um, is that when I teach civics, I have for years used the Oxford Picture Dictionaries page that you see here um, called Civic Rights and Responsibilities. It's on your slide. It goes over kind of, you know, like some vocabulary and also your rights. So freedom of um, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, those, those kinds of things. And so last year when we were when we were doing um, some of these lessons, I added an article about Black Lives Matter, um, which is also on your slide. And we talked about what rights the Black Lives Matter movement is relying on, according to the article. So the students said, oh, they're, they're relying on freedom of assembly to be able to, you know, do their work or freedom of speech to be able to do their work. And this really helps the students to see these rights 
not in the abstract, but in terms of something that's happening right in their communities right now. Um, and some of these topics can be um, hard to talk about with students, especially in the lower, uh, the lower level classes, because they just might not have the vocabulary to have some of these more abstract conversations. Um, this is an example of an activity that I got from a beginning English teacher. Every day she teaches her students a different word to describe their feelings. And then the words kind of the feelings words get more complex as the week goes on. And then she uses these words to talk about anything that um, that she wants to talk about. Um, you could use them for to talk about vaccines or um, current events. Um, it can be used with both words like how does the reading make you feel, for example, or pictures. How do you feel when you see this picture? How do you think this woman feels? Um, and it's a way to talk about complex things with a limited vocabulary that, um, that is appropriate to the student's language level. Um, and I just, I just want to note that this is a picture of um, Boston's, Boston's new mayor, our new mayor, um, which if you've ever seen any pictures of our former mayors, um, then people may have feelings about, <laughs> about her. Um, so, so there she is. And um, the, I also just want to say that talking about race and, um, and issues of racial equity and justice provide context for what your students might already be experiencing. Um, and they can be complicated for English for ESOL students, for immigrants, because they don't always have the cultural context for what these things look like in the US. So as Dalsant said, there might be racism everywhere, but in the US, the students have to learn what the system looks like here and then how to respond to it. So his reaction to police brutality was, this is America, what's happening, right? And one of my jobs as a teacher is to answer that question, what is happening <laughs> um, here in America? So last June, when my students wanted to talk about George Floyd, I was actually ready because we had already done a unit on um, race and racism where we talked about systemic racism and police brutality. So when they came into class wanting to talk about what they were seeing on the news and, and in the streets, um, we could reference concepts that they already understood and that they had already talked about in class. And this gave them context for what they were seeing. Um, and because I had prepared in advance, I didn't have to come up with something on the fly about something really intense when the students just walked in and were like, okay, um, this is what we wanna talk about. I wasn't like, ah, because we'd already kind of laid groundwork before something, um, I mean, not before something big happened, but in, in this case, before George Floyd was killed, we'd already laid some groundwork. Um, and, and I also just wanna just point out, um, which especially for, I think for white teachers, we often default to talking about the negatives of racism only when we start thinking about incorporating issues of um, race and equity in the classroom, but of course, there are many beautiful stories of culture and resilience and fun um, that can be used also to talk about these issues. So that's just a, a little reminder that that it's that talking about race in the classroom isn't always just like this is so terrible. It's also an, a story of uplift and beauty and um, uh, in in one's in one's race and cultural identities. So I, I also, I wanted to say, so I've been talking a lot about sort of explicitly teaching race and racism, which I do do sometimes, but um, addressing race and racial justice and equity in the classroom doesn't always mean just talking about race and or equity explicitly. Um, for me, it means making choices as a teacher about what to teach and how to teach it. Um, and so making choices like I'm gonna teach, you know, 
where to put your hands if you get pulled over in addition to teaching the language parts of that, the vocabulary parts of that. So those are choices that I make based on who my students are um, and what, what they, what I think they need and what they have said that they need um, <laughs> also. So last year, um, one of my students came to class. Um, this was, we were on Zoom remote class, um, having watched the video of George Floyd being killed and she was having nightmares. She was um, scared to leave her house. She talked about going back to Haiti where she might feel safer. Um, and so we did talk about it in class um, using, like I said before, some of the foundations that we'd already talked about um, and um, that we'd talked about earlier in the year. Um, and when we'd finished talking about it explicitly, um, I showed them this picture. Um, and so, like I said, this is a picture from one of the um, protests uh, that had happened in Boston last spring. And the, it, the photo is from, um, is from a, an intersection not far from where a lot of, from where me and a lot of my students live. So it was sort of part of their general, like um, the landscape of their lives last spring. Um, the third one, from the left says, uh, I don't know if you can see it that clearly in the slide, but it says, we are strong, we are beautiful, and we are excellent. Um, and so after Roland had come to class with, so, with just so much fear, um, and we had, done, we had done a lot of talking about our feelings and having the students kind of express how they were feeling and what they were learning um, from the news and, after that, after we talked about it explicitly, we then used this mantra, um, we are strong, we are beautiful, we are excellent at the end of class for the rest of the year, no matter what the content of the lesson was, whether it was about race or not, we just, we use this as kind of a closing, um, a closing breath at the end of every class. Um, it wasn't explicitly about race, but it, was what the students needed at the time because of who they were and what they were experiencing. And so, um, so it's doing some of this work is also about uh, addressing racism, not always just about talking about racism, I guess is what I would say. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to say about the how um, is to remember to speak from your own experience, but use resources that speak to the experiences of your students. Um, so while I often have more historical and cultural knowledge about the systems at play in this country than my students do, as a white person, as a native speaker, as you know, uh, a Jewish person, as all of these sort of as my identities, um, <laughs> I don't have the same experiences of racism as my students and as my colleagues who might be immigrants and people of color themselves. So um, because of who I am and where I come from, my experience, for example, my experience of getting a job might be really different from my students' experiences of getting a job. Their experiences are much more like what you, this quote that you see here on the screen. Um, there are things that I don't have to think about. And so while I always tell my students about my experiences at, in, with whatever we're talking about, I also try to make it clear that my experience might be different from what their experience is gonna be and to talk about why that is. Um, this is one of the reasons that I use the change agent so much actually, which is kind of how we got here, <laughs> how I got here in the first place is because I, I teach a lot from the change agent. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute, but it's been invaluable for me to do this work um, and to work with this content because the articles are written by adult students and speak to a broad array of experiences that are similar to those of my students whereas I come from um, a different background than them. 
Um, and so I work to bring in resources that they can identify with that speak to their experiences, however different those might be from my own.